Hi there! Today I'm going to show you how to build a simple Time Domain Reflectometer, or TDR. I designed this a little while back with the intention of taking it out into the field, so it is battery operated by a 1.5 volt C-cell, and it is quite compact. It's really useful in looking at a lot of different things about coax, such as velocity factor, or distance to fault, or checking its impedance, seeing if it's open, or if it's shorted, if it's kinked, if you have a barrel connector in it, how far the barrel connector is away, uh, if you've got a big roll of coax and you want to see how many feet is on that coax without unraveling it, this is another really handy tool to have. Or if you have a bunch of old oscilloscopes like I do and uh, have a problem collecting old oscilloscopes like I do and uh, want to check the graticule for accuracy, it's also uh, quite useful in that. So, uh, it's quite a simple circuit. It requires the use of another simple oscilloscope like my old TDS-220 or something equivalent to it and a calculator. There's a little bit of math involved, but I've simplified it as much as I can, I'd think. And uh, I think you'll find it uh, quite easy to uh, work with. So I've got the schematics already, and we can check out the schematics and see how this thing is built. So let's uh, head to the bench here and check them out. Here's the TDR power supply. It runs off of a 1.5 volt C-cell battery, which oscillates these two transistors with this coil here and runs through a multiplication stack and we get about 330 volts free floating out of that end of the stack. So if you build this you want to exercise caution because it can zap you. Of course you're building this at your own risk so just take care. When this is used in the circuit in combination with the TDR head this voltage is usually between 70 and 150 volts. It will drag this down to that point and hold it throughout the life of the battery. So the values that have been chosen in this oscillator and this entire circuit have been chosen for an equilibrium so that as the battery voltage drops from 1.5 down to about 1.2 volts this will still source enough voltage so that the TDR head keeps operating. This 560 ohm base and 10k ohm base resistor are really uh, specifically chosen so that this oscillator will operate in a certain range. So if you're going to use these transistors, I suggest you stay with the values, but if you're going to breadboard this, you can do anything you want, obviously, and maybe try and peek up uh, some other circuit or experiment with it. This little coil here is 100 microhenries, and you'll notice that in the picture I post here, it's the little green guy that's mounted to the top of the board. The uh, surface mount 100 microhenry chokes that I have, or inductors I should call them, are low Q, and they don't give me as much voltage up at this point. So that green fella has got a higher Q, so I opted to use a through hole mount choke instead, so that's why it's mounted above the board. You can see what I've done is uh, all surface mount, and that's just because I have a lot of surface mount parts and it makes it really compact. This could very easily be built through hole with a 1N4152 glass uh, uh, diodes and everything, you know, the TO92 package, BC807s and 817s. You know, you can use all through hole stuff here if you like. It'd just be a little bit larger, but uh, as I say, I opted to go with this because it's small and it fits in my nice little project box. That's also why I opted to use that C-cell battery, because with uh, two cushions, they're actually <laughs> cushions designed for the bottom of a chair uh, to stop you from scratching your floors, uh, they, they fit on the sides of the box and they just hold the battery snug. Not snug that it's tight, but that it can slide up and down so the spring can properly keep tension on the battery against the other little circuit board that I made under there that um, contacts the positive of the battery. So that's pretty much this uh, circuit. It runs at 47 kilohertz and uh, that'll change as the battery voltage goes low and uh, as the circuit gets loaded and so on and so forth. These are all free float voltages. When this is loaded, this will be down around 30, maybe uh, 35 volts when it's loaded with a transistor at this end with the avalanche, which I'll get into explaining here quite soon. And uh, this will be down anywhere between 70 and about 150 volts. So as I say again, exercise caution when you're around there. It's enough to give you a bit of a buzz, but it's extremely low current. You should always exercise caution around that uh, around that voltage. Notice the polarity of the LED. You want the LED's polarity to be this way in order for it to glow. The uh, 10K resistor, you don't want to go much lower than 10K because it'll drag the voltage down at this point. I used a high brightness green LED, which you'll see in the picture there. Uh, it glows quite bright with a 10K resistor, and uh, if you'd start to down that to about 5K or whatever, you're going to start to pull this down, and of course, if you pull the peak to peak down here, the uh, DC voltage at this end of the stack will suffer. Uh, 
As I say, it's about an equilibrium. You want to get the most battery life out of it, and you want to keep this point above the point where the transistor in the head starts to avalanche. So that's it. Let's take a look inside the head, and I'll show you how the head's made. Here we have the TDR head schematic. As you can see, it's very simple. The high voltage comes in here through this 100K resistor, and the 7.5 picofarad capacitor on the collector here sets the amplitude of the initial pulse. The 100K resistor can be swapped out if you have a more rigid power supply to a 220K. Uh, example like a Lambda Model 71 or something like that, that will provide more current and more voltage. If you leave the 100K in here, it will work with a higher current power supply. You just have a very small window of voltage that it will work in. So if you up this to 220K, you get a, quite a broad window that this uh, circuit will avalanche in. The 10K resistor on the base is really just a standard resistor that I found that works with all of the uh, transistors I've got. With the exception of some of the 2N2222s, they wanted a 5K resistor or a 4.7. But other than that, this is a pretty common uh, value for this circuit. This uh, 68 ohm, 68 ohm, and a 100 ohm network is really just to trim the boot up on the fall side of the signal and uh, to get bit rid of a little bit of ringing and uh, make the signal look a little bit cleaner in the oscilloscope. That's all that's there for. Now the lead inductance in this circuit is a little bit critical and it will depend on where you solder the resistors in and uh, how long the leads are on the various transistors. Uh, I will show you my surface mount version here in just a few moments and uh, that'll give you an example of the, um, of the lead inductance. So this is the first one that I made. It's just on a... Um, there it is, it finally focused. It's just on a BNC jack. This was my experiment. You can see the TO92, 2N3904. You can see the 268Ks and the 100 ohm resistor. Uh, the uh, 100 K ohm resistors on this side, I just used quarter watts. And there's a, a 7.5 picofarad cap there. And that pretty much makes the whole circuit. This was the uh, experiment and it works very well. In fact, um, you know, this could be used just the way it is. It uh, gives a really, really nice clean pulse and a really short rise and fall time. So what we'll do next is we'll check out the uh, surface mount version and I'll explain that. Here we have the surface mount version of this TDR head. You can see there's a few circuit variations in this and I had to add some components. The MMBT3904 is the surface mount version of the 2N3904. It's much smaller and there's a lot less lead on the MMBT3904. So I had to add some 4.7 nanohenry inductors in the leads of this transistor to mimic the through-hole version, 2N3904, and to mimic the inductance of the components attached to it, like the peanut-style resistors. So by removing these 4.7 nanohenry uh, inductors in this circuit we get a really ugly looking pulse and the boot is really elongated so if you're going to build this surface mount version you're definitely going to need to add some lead inductance you can do it with small coils of wire if you're really good or you can just get some 0603 parts like I did and uh, put them in the uh, leads of the uh, transistor and that really really helps the circuit out so we'll look at some pictures here We'll see, uh, my other half is into uh, macro photography, so she took these pictures for me and did a pretty good job. The uh, inductors almost look like jade or jewelry or something. The, uh, the 4.7 nanohenry inductors are standing up, and you'll notice that the MMBT3904 is upside down in the circuit. And the reason that it's upside down is to save space. I had to stand the uh, 4.7 nanohenry inductors up because there's just not enough room on that board to mount all these inductors. So it worked out quite well. And uh, it also, you know, stands up and holds that little transistor upside down and clears the shell with a little bit to spare. You'll see that the uh, 100 ohm and the 4.7 nanohenry at the uh, BNC jack end of things are also standing up. And that's for space considerations too. There's three 22 picofarad capacitors instead of one 7.5 picofarad capacitor. And the reason being is 0402 parts usually have a 50 volt maximum. So I don't want to exceed the maximum. So by putting three of them in series, I get 150 working volts out of that at 7.3 picofarad, which works just fine. On the flip side of this connector, we can see the 100K1206 style uh, resistor mounted to the back side, and that's pretty much all that's on the back side at all. And uh, the coax runs into that, and the uh, high voltage goes through that 100K resistor and onto the other side of the board through the inductors. And that's pretty much this uh, surface mount uh, circuit. 
So if you're wanting to make this, uh, stick close to these values with the MMBT3904 because there's a lot of time fooling with this thing, trying to make that surface mount circuit work very well. It, uh, the uh, the through-hole version, you solder a bunch of parts together and it works right off the bat. So uh, if you're wanting to follow this MMBT3904 uh, TDR head, uh, try and mimic the circuit as closely as possible. The capacitor arrangement really isn't all that critical, uh, but the inductors and the leads, and then of course the uh, 68 ohm and 100 ohm output network is a little bit critical. So you just want to follow close to that. Again, if you want to use this TDR head with a, a higher current sourcing power supply, you're going to probably want to uh, up that 100k resistor to a 220k resistor and uh, that will give you a larger window of operating and that's that so let's get into some of the math and uh, we'll also look at how these tdrs work and the different ones operate on uh, some different oscilloscopes okay see you in the next shot here we have the tdr hooked directly to the input of my oscilloscope through a bnct connector here this open end on the BNCT connector is where we're going to hook our coax to be analyzed. The pulse you see on the screen here is being created by this little TDR head right here. The pulse is about 10 volts peak to peak, the rise time is about 900 picoseconds, and the fall time is about 3 nanoseconds. Before you go hooking your TDR directly to the input of your oscilloscope, you want to verify that your TDR is working properly and that it's not going to overload the input of your oscilloscope as to damage it. So next what we're going to do is we're going to look at the velocity factor of some coax. Before we start measuring your thousand foot roll of coax, or looking for a distance default or that corroded barrel connector buried in your backyard, we need to know the velocity factor of the coax. This is crucial in making an accurate measurement. A lot of people like to use the uh, 0.66 standard and uh, just use that as a standard velocity factor, but uh, if you have a, uh, say, a foam polystyrene, uh, the difference is from 0.66 to 0.91, and that can cause a really inaccurate reading. So it is kind of crucial to really know what the velocity factor of your coax is. It also changes with age which is another important factor. So if you have the uh, ability to cut a small chunk of the coax off that you want to measure, that is uh, a really good idea, and you can um, really verify its exact velocity factor by, uh, by doing this and hooking it up to an oscilloscope. So to give you an idea of the differences in velocity factors, a solid polyethylene, or PE, is usually 0.66. Foam polyethylene is usually 0.80. Foam polystyrene is usually 0.91. Airspace polyethylene, or ASP, is usually 0.84 to 0.88. Solid Teflon is anywhere from 0.69 or 0.69 to uh, 0.70. Airspace Teflon, AST, is usually 0.85 to 0.90. So that gives you an idea of the differences in the dielectrics inside of the coax. So the dielectric is usually the insulator in the uh, center of the coax that insulates the, uh, the center conductor from the uh, outer braid. That is the dielectric. So what we're going to do now is uh, verify the velocity factor of this piece of coax right here. This is a random chunk I've got. So the first thing you have to do is take a piece of coax and uh, measure it out to a certain amount of inches and cut it off. This I've measured out to 172 inches. This is a random piece I've had kicking about. So it measures in at 172 inches. So that's the first thing you want to write down on your piece of paper. The second thing that we're going to end up doing here is we're going to hook this up to the time domain reflectometer and see how long it takes for the signal to go down the coax, rebound, and come back again to the main signal. So what we need to do to do that is put this BNC connector, which I've just tacked onto the end of this coax loosely, and the shield is touching the outer uh, shell here. So we'll put this onto the TDR. So you'll see that the amplitude of the TDR signal dropped a little bit. That's fine. So now the reflected signal is going to be over here, so I'm going to move this pulse over on the screen. So there is the reflected signal at the end of the coax. So the BNC end here is running down to the open end and it's coming back. If I remove this piece of coax, you can see that the reflected signal goes away. 
If I put this on, it comes back again. So we know that that is the end of the coax. Now, if you look further down the line, you'll see more picks that some go up and some that go down. You want to ignore all of those. It's always the first signal that is the reflected. Okay, the, the first pulse that you see coming back is, is the reflected. So what we're going to do to determine the time that it takes to go from this end to this end and come back again is we're going to use our cursors and measure that in nanoseconds. So on your DSO, you want to turn your cursors on. Okay, I've got a pair of dots turned on here, so I'm going to go to vertical bars. So here's my vertical bars. So a lot of people want to measure this from the incident edge to the reflected edge. Now that's completely fine. You can measure it from the incident edge to the reflected edge if you have ad adequate uh, width in your signal. As you start looking at longer and longer pieces of coax, you're going to lose that width, and this is going to go together and start looking like just two vertical bars. So you're going to probably want to start measuring it at the peaks, and that's absolutely fine. As you can see, we have 36.5 nanoseconds from the incident edge to the reflected. We'll move it over to the peak, and we'll move it over to the peak of the reflected, and we still have the delta at 36.5 nanoseconds. So that's the time it's taking for the signal to go come down here, reflect, and come back up. So that's the second figure we need to write down on the piece of paper. We have 172 inches to write down, and we have 36.5 nanoseconds is what we want to write down next. When I come back here with a piece of paper in front of the camera, I'll show you how to calculate the velocity factor with those two figures. This is how we determine the velocity factor of an unknown piece of coax. So this unknown piece of coax that we have is 172 inches long because we have verified that by measuring it with a measuring tape. We've also taken this 172 inch piece of coax and attached it to the time domain reflectometer that we've just built and we've used an oscilloscope to verify that the round trip time is 36.5 nanoseconds. Again, on the oscilloscope screen, we have the TDR pulse here, we have the end of the coax and the reflection here. This is the delta time between these two points, and it is also the round trip time it takes for the pulse to come from the TDR, go through the coax, hit the open end, and reflect back to the TDR again. So another important piece of the puzzle we need to know is that in optimum conditions, electricity will travel at 11.8 inches per nanosecond. So this 36.5 nanoseconds that we have is a round trip. That's from the beginning of the coax to the end and reflecting back. Well, we only want to know the time it takes for the signal to go from the beginning of the coax to the end of the coax. And how we get that is we take this 36.5 and simply divide it by 2. 36.5 divided by 2 equals 18.25 nanoseconds, and that is a one-way trip. Now we can calculate the velocity factor very easily by taking 172, dividing that by 18.25, and again dividing it by 11.8, which equals 0.798 or we can say 0.80% velocity factor. And that's just how simple it is to calculate the velocity factor. Now a lot of manufacturers data sheets include the nanoseconds per foot. We can simply calculate that by taking 172, dividing that by 12, which equals 14.3 three feet of coax that we have. All we've done is simply taken the inches and converted it to feet here. So now we take this 18.25 nanoseconds and divide that by 14.3 feet which equals 1.276 nanoseconds per foot. Now, if we look at the manufacturer's data sheets, we'll find that these two figures here and here come very close to foam polyethylene type dielectric, or FE for short. And that's just how simple it is to determine your velocity factor with a TDR 
and a measuring tape.